How are you, Casey? I know it has been a busy week. How are you? I'm great. It has been a busy week, though. That's for sure. Yes. But I'm glad to be here with you today. That's awesome. Yeah, we have so much to talk about. I'm very excited to present an upcoming show we have been working since December, a collaboration between Federal File and Blind Gallery, and also learn from your own words about your recent collection with Bright Moments, 923 Empty Rooms, which, by the way, looks super good. I am very sad I couldn't be there in one of those Bright Moments galleries, and I saw some of the videos, and I think that looks fantastic. And yeah, if we have time, I would really like to get deeper into Federal File, the evolution of your gallery. You have been running that gallery wearing different hats for quite some time now, and some fantastic artists has been showcased there. Finally, I would really like to learn more about your teaching practice and how processing got started. There is so much content, but let's start with the recent collection, Casey, the 923 empty rooms. What are your thoughts regarding the whole mechanism how it was minted, because it's very unique what you did there with Bright Moments. Yes. So this work, or I would say like the ideas behind the work, have been cooking for quite a while. They started back in 2015. And fundamentally, the work looks at the history of visual representation, and it really focuses on the idea of the still life. I think because the still life is such a contained genre, it's so straightforward in a way. Put some things in the room, on the table and then represent them, it's been a place where a lot of artists have experimented and explored alternate forms of ways of making pictures, ways of representing the world. And so the idea of an empty room, it comes from a conversation between David Hockney and Lawrence Wetchler, and also Robert Irwin. Lawrence Wetchler was kind of a mediator between them. And this idea that as artists were experimenting more and more with the still life, with the beginning of cubism, moving into more of an analytical cubism, that things were moving away from the world and moving into a space of ideas. I think the quote was, if this continues, you might as well be painting an empty room. That was the quote. That's what I picked up on. For me, my work is also about the digital image, what fundamentally the digital material is, and also about the history of simulation. For me, this work, it's all about these ideas of representing the world, representing ideas through simulation, and it's things I've been working on for a very long time. The work became a piece of software that was exhibited at the Bitforms Gallery in New York in 2016. And I continued working on these things. But in the last year, I was approached by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art uh, here locally. I'm in Los Angeles which is also called the LACMA. Um, and they were preparing a show called Coded, which is about the history of the computer and art from 1952 to 1982. And so it spans this 50 year period before the personal computer really changed the way that computers and the artist studio engaged with each other. And for that commission, I began to re-explore these ideas, thinking about the history of the computer and the art, thinking about the history of painting within the context of the museum. The result of that was a project called An Empty Room, which was a three-channel video projection at LACMA. That was a really good opportunity to be in the museum, to be in the coded exhibition, and to have a lot of conversations with people. When I was meeting with Seth from Bright Moments, we together hatched this idea of evolving the empty room piece further, tying that in to what Bright Moments has been doing, building these different spaces around the world. This was a project that was a physical gallery installation for a week in all of the Bright Moment spaces. And then also um, over six days, it was a release of 150 new empty rooms on the art blocks. It started in Tokyo, then the next day was in Berlin, in London, in New York, and then Mexico City. And we wrapped up in Saturday in Los Angeles. And every city had a party reception opening as well for the local community to get together. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't know it evolved so many times. That's very interesting because then when it was decided that it was going to be showcased with bright moments, you then input that part, like the cities, like the different cities into the collections. So it's like a piece that has been exhibited a couple of times, and then this is like the final iteration. Do you see it evolving, or this is it, Casey? There's one more piece of it planned, and then it will be completely finished. I'm going to have a show in New York at the Bitforms Gallery in November, 
And that's going to bring together the final piece of the empty rooms work and the final piece of what the series before called still life. And those are all going to be exhibited in New York in the gallery. And that will be the conclusion of this long arc, this long body of work. Exciting. It's funny because Seth was in the podcast a few weeks ago before this collection was announced. And he said, yeah, we have a pretty special collection with an OG artist, but it's going to come out soon. And he couldn't mention it because it wasn't announced. But when it was announced, I saw, okay, this is who Seth was talking about. So pretty special, Casey. How does it feel? Because the mechanics and basically this was showcased worldwide, physically and also digitally, of course. How does it feel for you that has been around? You have been part of many exhibitions. Your work has been exhibited in different parts of the world. But this new concept of the minting through different days, through a week, and you knowing that, okay, somebody's minting this right now in Tokyo or in Mexico City. How does that feel as an artist uh, for you? Yeah, I think that's one thing that for me, Bright Moments and Art Blocks were able to bring together. I love what Bright Moments has been doing with minting in person. For example, when I was in Berlin last year, standing with the collector as the piece was being revealed for the very first time, I had never seen it before. The person who had collected the work had never seen it before. And we were both having that experience together. And for me, that's a wonderful sort of moment that I think Bright Moments has been developing and then pursuing in the different spaces with their different different events. Also, the Art Blocks model, what Snowfro invented really with the very first releases on Art Blocks, and what now I'm very happy to call it long form generative art, where you have one piece of software that's capable of producing so many different variations. But then we sort of mint them blind and you don't really see the results or you don't really see what the thumbprints of each work will be until they're revealed. That was something that was, I think, a new idea in the generative art space. Generative art has been around for over 50 years. In a way, I was doing that in my gallery installations 20 years back. I would often have a, a grid of prints on the wall in addition to the software running live. But this was at a scale that was really purely digital. That was really interesting. So I think... For me, this piece was about combining the ideas and the collaboration with Art Blocks with ideas and collaboration with Bright Moments. It was really an extraordinary six days. I think there's a lot of artists on this call, a lot of friends on this call. I'm really happy to see everybody. Everybody can tell you that an Art Blocks um, auction is really nerve wracking. I don't think I realized how nerve wracking six six of them a row in a row over six days would be. It was it was pretty amazing and pretty special. But the team at Bright Moments, the team at Art Blocks, they're so wonderful, so supportive that I really feel like this was something that none of us could have done on our own, but we were able to pull off together. Oh, I can imagine that must be, yeah, super filled with excitement, but I mean, probably you didn't get much sleep over the past few days, but that's part of the excitement. That's why you worked so much on a project to get to that point. Actually, on that topic, Casey, when we started chatting about the collaboration between Federal File and, and Blind Gallery, you told me an analogy that I, I think was very interesting. You said writing a generative coded collection is like writing a novel, right? In terms of the time it takes, the amount of effort. And we can see from this collection that you have been working on it for a long time. So in terms of your art, and maybe it's the, the question is getting much complicated, but when you think about your art before the blockchain and what Art Blocks and Eric introduced with generative long form collections and your works before that. Now that you have to produce these very long collections, I mean, not always, but when you think about 923 rooms, there are over 900 pieces. When you think about 20 years in the past, when you were creating your work that maybe was one on ones, the medium was very different. Is it more challenging when you think about the time? that it takes to create these pieces uh, compared to before the blockchain. Have you thought about that? Is it more time intensive these days or nothing has changed for you in terms of the amount of time you dedicate to create a collection? That's a really interesting question. I don't know that I can answer it precisely because the work often flows in high intensity moments and then it sometimes will just sit for many months. But I would say the model that many generative artists were using before that I was using and really enjoyed using is I would produce like a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand outputs. And I might select 
from that one or 10 to show to people. That's sort of the classical model. When I'm working in that way, you can make a system or make a space that's full of unexpected opportunities. And you don't really need to be concerned if something shows up that sort of isn't exciting or isn't novel, that's completely okay. And that's sort of a part of the process. But when there's a situation where I, as the author, as the artist, need to be comfortable and confident about every single thing that comes out of the system, that makes it far more energy intensive. I would say it's a bit of a mixed feeling because sometimes when you do work on something and it can only produce things that you feel confident with, you're cutting down on some of the very unexpected edge cases that can happen. You can cut down on many exciting possibilities. I don't feel that one is better than the other. I feel that different ideas lend themselves towards one or the other. Right. There are many factors involved. And yeah, I, I think that... And sorry, and, like, sorry. And the other thing too is like a series of 50, like what's needed to do that is very different from what's needed for like a series of 1,000 as well. And so I think different ideas lend themselves to different quantities, different systems. Sorry, Carla. No, no, that's okay. My following question is, when do you decide, okay, this collection is done. Now I'm ready to release it. It's going to be 50 pieces. Or actually, no, I will keep going and this will be 500 pieces or 1,000 pieces. In your case, because I think it might be different for each artist, but how do you decide that, Casey, when the collection is finally done? Yeah, because I work in such a way where I'm really working with systems and ideas. Oftentimes, the core idea at the beginning of the project kind of defines its scope or its expanse. And so the scale at which the work becomes, if it's a release of 50 or the release of 1,000, is sort of built in from the very beginning. But oftentimes, I think that's a question a lot of artists get in general is, when do you know work is done? And for me, I just keep developing ideas and like, oh, what if I tried this? What if I tried this? What would happen? And I live with that and I experience it and I explore it. And eventually over time, you'll let it sit for a month and then come back to it. And you'll just kind of feel that, feel that it's ready. For me, that's very intuitive. I think a part of being, for me, a generative artist is balancing sensibility, intuition, aesthetics with the uh, ability to realize those things technically. And the two work in balance. Mm -hmm. Right. As I mentioned earlier, and by the way, if anybody in the audience has a question for Casey, feel free to use the chat icon at the bottom right. You can tweet your questions. We'll try to get to those towards the end of the session. I also mentioned, and we shared last week very briefly, that we have been collaborating on a show for Federal File and Blind Gallery. And in this case, you took the role of a curator. You were part of the selection process of the artist. You have been following the artist's progress and giving some input. How does it feel for you, Casey, after working so many pieces of art, when you take the curator role and you see things from the outside? What do you think are the main differences when you look into creating a show, but you are not involved as an artist but as a curator what are the challenges what are the the main differences that you have noticed yeah thanks for the question i had kind of a new idea while you're asking the question i think for me the role of curating is a little similar to what i do as an educator meaning that when i'm working with graduate students what i'm doing often is listening to them hearing what they want to do and then trying to guide them help them sort of realize what they want to realize. And for me, that's a part of the curatorial role. I didn't expect to be curating shows over the last couple of years, but when we decided to build Feral File, and now it's been over three years ago, I really felt that I needed to curate the first show just to make sure it was ready for other people. Like I needed to, in a way, test drive it to make sure I felt confident in asking other people to do the same thing. And so on that first show, Social Codes, I discovered that I really enjoyed the process. Like I like thinking about the overall theme. I like inviting the artists and I just love the process of doing studio visits and mentoring in a way, building the show together. And so since then I've, I've started curating with energy and that was sort of unexpected, but it's been a wonderful process. And so through Feral File, 
we've put on 35 shows now. We've worked with so many different curators. The primary idea of Feral File is to invite a curator to put together a show. Then that curator defines the theme of the show, invites the artist, collaborates, works with the artist. One thing that we've done on Feral File is we worked with curators who I think are at the top of their game. Like we've worked with Tina Rivers Ryan from the Buffalo Art Museum. We've worked with Dominica Coranta, who's been curating this kind of work for decades. We've worked with Christian Paul at the Whitney Museum, who's been curating there. That's been wonderful. So exciting to sort of make these connections. But at the same time, we've also been inviting artists to curate shows too. There's a tradition and history of this. I think right now the shows that Rick Silva, that was our third show, and Chris Coleman put together were really strong shows. I feel now that we're building new institutions, we are exploring new ideas like as a group over the last few years with blockchains, NFTs, that one thing that we can do is experiment with inviting artists to be curators. And I think that the shows that the artists have curated on Feral File have been really interesting in different ways than the shows that were put together by more traditional curators. So I'm excited to continue exploring both. Right. That's something that I see clearly is that Feral File, the curator is kind of the centerpiece. When you look at other galleries in the digital world, other platforms, that's not necessarily the case, <clears throat> but that's something that Feral File pushes. It's very clear that's there. I remember the second to last show from Fetal File, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it, that was the opening of Fetal File 2.0. The show I'm referring to is N equal 12, curated by Aaron Pini. That was interesting. I mean, it's a group show, so many fantastic artists in that show, but what caught my attention was this evolution of Fetal File. You have, as you said, it's been three years, and now you have Federal File 2.0. Can you tell us a bit about that evolution? What has changed and why Federal File changed? For sure. First, I want to start by saying what Federal File, how it's the same, like the thing that has been a continuity. One thing that's the same is still the shows are curator driven. One of the ideas of that is that if we're doing a show every month, that's our rhythm right now, we want to have every show feel different. We want to have different ideas different points of view expressed. And so that's one of the primary reasons of commissioning curators. And I think it's important to say too, that the majority of the shows over the last year and a half have been through open calls. So basically putting out an announcement that we are interested in your proposals and then we then collaborate with the curators to realize them. And then the other thing that's been constant on Feral File is that the group show is the primary kind of show. When we have a group show, the artists all swap works with each other. So for example, if there's 10 artists in the show, each of those artists receives a work from the other nine artists. And for me, that's really important. This sort of developing development of community and, and sharing among the artists. The principle is that the artists create work, they share with each other, and then they also produce other work that can bring in collectors into the mix. I think Feral File 1 was really focused on the relationship between the artist and the curators. Feral File 2, we're working harder to establish more of a, like a triad between the artists, the curators, and the collectors as well. So what's different about Feral File 2? I think there's two main differences. One is that we are making the works available in sets, meaning that the idea is that the curator brought these artists together for a reason. We really want the collectors to collect one work from each artist that we've put together into a group. So that is one thing, the idea of keeping the artists together. I think financially, that's really interesting. Because that means that if a set is sold, all the artists receive like equal splits from there. The other thing that's different on Feral File too, is that when Feral File was founded, it was in more of a traditional editions model, an analog edition model, like for example, silk screens or etchings, where one file would be copied. For example, a video file would sort of be copied 50 times. And then we would sell like 50 of the same video file, which is really common still on a lot of like Tezos platforms. But what we've sort of discovered over the years is that as collectors ourselves, we're really excited about unique things. We're moving forward with this digital editions model where you work in series, for example, a series of 50 or a series of 100, where every single artwork in that series relates to the other artworks, but each one is a one of one, each one is a unique piece. Yeah, I didn't think about the sets. When you sell a set, it's basically fantastic for everyone because everybody gets a piece. And yeah, the one-on-ones 
course, that's uh, very important. And it's similar to the long form mechanism where an algorithm produces one on ones of X, as they call it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're asking the collectors to trust the curators, basically. This group of artists, if it's six artists or 12 artists, are here for a reason. They're all amazing artists, regardless if someone has a, a market to totter or not. Basically, we're asking the collectors to trust the curators and to trust the quality of the work that the artists have made. And that's the primary reason for having things in these sets, one from each artist. Yeah, that's fantastic. Also, another thing that I find very interesting about Federal File is that it's been releasing works across different uh, blockchains. You can find works from Ethereum. You can find works on Tezos. I believe at the beginning they were released on Bitmark, which is another blockchain. So that's quite interesting. It's been like pushing the technology side, but also the artistic perspective by bringing curators in, bringing new mechanics. So you can see how it's evolving. I have a a question, Casey. It's a kind of a change of topic, but not so drastic. You are an educator. And in the upcoming show that uh, we're preparing, it's called Vistas. And the main theme, it's uh, landscapes, generative landscapes. And the reason why we selected that theme for this show between Federal Fire and Blind Gallery is because you noticed your students being kind of interested in this subject. What have you noticed from your students, from your classes, and also in general in the generative art space? It feels to me, but of course I haven't been around as long as you, that these landscapes, it's a very popular theme. Was it like that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when you started creating art? Was that the case or it felt much more abstract? Well, I think one question that I've always had is when generative art with digital computers, I think we should talk about that too. I think of generative art as not necessarily relating to software or computers inherently, like generative art in music and poetry and mosaics, all these other different forms. But with generative art and computers, when things were kicking off in the 1960s, everything was sort of inherently abstract. And how much of that was the intent of the artist versus how much of that was just what was possible to do at the moment? I know like a a number of founding artists, for example, Charles Surrey started off by working um, figuratively, but in a minimal way, because that's kind of what plotters were capable of doing at the time. And he later moved in computer graphics of rendering the body, rendering the figure in a more realistic way. How much of the aesthetics of really generative art were dictated by what was possible at the time versus the artist's intent? I think that's a really interesting question to dig deeper into. But no, I think things, from my experience, were working more in the abstract. There were artists like that were inspired by natural systems. There were art, pioneering artists like Colette Bangert, who were thinking about landscapes, even though the way that they were presented were more abstract. But I really noticed what's been happening over the last couple of years, I think on FX Hash specifically, is all of the collector energy and attention around things that are more representational and things that are sort of splitting the difference between abstraction and representation. In teaching and showing work to my students, I noticed the students were really interested in things that had more of a relationship to representational imagery. I wanted to just sort of like remove some of my filters, some of my biases as being somebody who's kind of like a hard edge abstractionist to look deeper at that work. It's been wonderful to dig in there I think, yeah, the fundamental idea of the show is there's so much innovative, wonderful work going on in this area. Let's put together a show around it and see how it feels. I think the work is so strong in the show. It's really hard not to talk about it specifically and talk about the artists involved, but just seeing it evolve over the last few months, it's really been pushed far and there's so many extraordinary details in the work. I'm really thrilled to get this work out and for people to see it. Yeah, me too. I'm super excited about the show and to give some context about the mechanics, the artists are basically secret. Nobody knows who they are. We'll start to share previews. We'll start to share the artworks, I believe, the day after tomorrow. And collectors basically collect based on the art after a week we reveal the names of the artists. So this creates uh, a lot of interesting mechanics that there are collectors researching. We sometimes share hints and they start to explore different platforms, different galleries, trying to figure out who they are. 
but other collectors actually are interested in collecting what they like and then finally meeting or discovering who the artist was. In general, it's a very fun experience. And what we can say now is that there are six artists uh, that have been working for, I believe, over three months. And yeah, the previews, and we cannot wait to share these previews over the next days. It will run on FX Hash, which is the platform on Tesos for generative art. I'm super excited about that one. And Casey asked the idea started in your teaching uh, with your students. I've been exploring your collections for a while. I've been exploring your website. I've been exploring the work you have done with processing and the evolution. But not sure if I'm not looking at the right place, but it's it's a little bit harder to actually find, I mean, imagining how it is a, a typical class, a typical course with Casey Rees. So could you share a bit about your teaching practice? How diverse are your students? Is this usually small groups of students? I imagine it has evolved over time, but how is usually your teaching practice? How is the course? What are the topics that are in there? Yeah, so I teach at a school of arts and architecture in a program called uh, Design Media Arts. I teach studio classes. The way that studio classes operate is different from how a lot of other things at a university operates. I guess another important thing to say is that I do teach at UCLA, which is a public school. A lot of the students are being supported. And we spend a lot of time in class together. We spend six hours a week. And so we share that time in different ways. We spend time making work. We spend time talking about the work. Actually, about half our time each week is spent in critique and review, sharing work with each other and talking about the ideas behind it and sort of what we experience. And then we also do technical work, too. We look at code examples. We write code. Um, the class is really a mix of different things. And we learn all the things that you would learn in an intro to computer science class. We learn about variables and loops and arrays. But we do, we learn about them in a very different way with a focus on visuals and making media to be experienced. It's very similar to a traditional studio class, but we're using code as the medium. I also teach junior, senior level special topics classes where we dig further into the topic of generative art. Um, and then I also teach a lot of uh, graduate student classes, which are more seminar based, like reading, writing, making work that sometimes go a little bit further back into the history of generative art and the history of ideas around this space. And how does being a professor, a teacher, improve your art? Do you see a synergy there? Do you learn from your students and from their works, from their questions? How does it influence your work, Casey? Yeah, I think the university itself is just a really fertile place for ideas. Talking with the other professors, talking with the graduate students, talking with the undergraduate students, there's a constant source of new references. What are other people reading? What other artists are other people looking at? And so I think it's more of a space where there's like a sea of ideas floating around. And I think that's the way that all of us have our practices supported by being here. Right. And no, there is the Processing Foundation, which is, I think, for everybody interested in computer art, everybody knows what processing is and how big of an impact it has caused. You know, I want to go into the early days, Casey, of processing. How was computer art at the time? How did you actually start processing? What were like the first two years of this uh, foundation? And why did you have this need? How was the story of the creation of processing? Yeah, it's a real once upon a time kind of story. It's been 22 years now. We celebrated our 20th anniversary two August ago. Processing was started at the MIT Media Lab is sort of a, a research sort of place at MIT for media arts and sciences. And Ben Fry and I are the two co-founders of Processing. We're studying with John Maeda. John is somebody who studied computer science at MIT and then studied art in Japan and then came to the Media Lab to really make a hybrid of the two. He's a real pioneer, a real innovator. I was out in the world working in New York in the early days of the web. I saw John's work for the first time, and it was like a lightning struck. It was sort of like, oh, I see a connection. I see how to combine what I know how to do with what I want to be doing. 
I went to Media Lab, as many other people did, to study with John. In the group that John was running, it was called the Aesthetics and Computation Group. It's very small. There were six people. People were coming from math, architecture, art, design, computer science. The whole idea of the group was like, let's figure out a synthesis between these really interesting ideas from software with ideas from art. And along with other people, let's make something new. There was a history of combining art and, and software together there at the Media Lab, um, going back further into Muriel Cooper's Visual Language Workshop. So the whole idea of processing was let's get this thing out of the institution and let's get it out into the world. And so Ben and I started processing, started bouncing around ideas in June of 2021. And by August of that year, Ben had made the first software release and taught his first workshop. I was actually in Tokyo with the software. For the first couple years, it was me and Ben working nights, working weekends, building out software. And so processing from the very beginning had these three different areas of focus. I mean, one was building the code, building the mental models around how artists and designers can get into coding. And then the other was community. Like we need to be talking with each other. We need to be sharing. And then the third was education. So we, we made processing from the very beginning as what we like to think of as a good first language. Everybody needs a first coding language. We feel that processing is a good general purpose way of thinking about software. After you sort of learn that first language, you can move into different areas maybe that are more specialized, uh, like for example, game programming or web programming or something like that. Right, it start more with the fundamentals and then you can move towards something more specific. 20 years, it's incredible, 20 years has passed. What do you think were like the, the critical let's call it elements or the, the critical reasons why this was so successful and it lasted so many years and there are so many people around the world using it these days. Do you think there are any particular, you, you mentioned three elements. Do you see any of those that was like the main reason why processing was so successful and is uh, today? I think it was all those things together. It was like the synthesis of them. I mean, there's other things around the project too. Another thing that we had from the very beginning was this idea of sketching and code, this idea of thinking about processing as a sketchbook, this idea that sketching is something that all artists do. Like either you sketch on paper or you sketch on a piano or you sketch with cardboard or something like that. This idea of coding is not this like rigid technical thing, but it's like a fluid medium to think through. That's been there since the beginning. And with processing, we had this like tension or balance between having things being straightforward and minimal, but also really powerful at the same time. I think that's been another important thing that's been consistent through it as well. But early on in, in the development of processing, Ben and I realized that we were like bottlenecks to new things happening. We developed a library system that allow other people to contribute to the project in different domains. Like Ben and I are both really visual people. We don't really have expertise in sound or other domains that other that people wanted processing to be able to do. And so there have been hundreds of libraries that are all contributed by different community members that are all made open source. I think that Ben and I have been at the core of processing for a long time. It's really been the larger community around it. It's been educators teaching with it. It's been people developing different libraries. It's been other projects branching out from processing. Originally, the wiring project, which became Arduino, P5JS, which was started by Lauren Lee McCarthy. There's many other variants of processing too. I think it's been flowing and fluid for a long time. And it's been really an effort by the community at large and a desire to bring coding to more people. I think when processing first started, it was a dream that artists would be learning how to code as undergraduates. And now it's, in many cases, that's a reality. For me, that's been the most beautiful thing about the project opening up new media for, for artists to think through and to work with. It's basically the tools that allow for formal education, as you said, for undergraduates. And yeah, I think it's fantastic. I'm very impressed by how big is the processing community. It's truly amazing. And Casey, we have covered many topics. We have covered your recent drop 
recent collection with Bright Moments. We talk about the upcoming show, Blind Gallery, Feral File. We talk about the evolution of Feral File. We talk about your teaching, how is it your teaching set up, let's call it that way. We talk about processing briefly. And I just cannot leave without asking you, how have you been able to do all these things? Because you wear so many hats, you have done so many amazing projects and you are creating art, you are running Federal File, you are involved in so many initiatives. What tip would you give artists, builders, and creators in general on how to accomplish and how to drive so many projects at the same time? Well, I think one thing that's, first of all, I'd advise not doing it. <laughs> But uh, one thing that's important to realize for me is that this is something that's just been growing for such a long time. Like processing has been going on for over 20 years. I've been teaching for that amount of time too. Feral File is young relatively with three years. But for me, it's becoming learning over the years how to be a better collaborator and how to work with other people more effectively. The team at Bitmark who makes Feral File is so strong, so many amazing people. Everybody here at UCLA, like the staff who runs the labs, the administration who take care of the annual budgets and things like that. It's just like learning how to collaborate with others. I think if the aim is really to be doing a lot of things in parallel. Yeah, that's great advice. There is a phrase that, let me see if I can recall it. It's if you want to get somewhere the fastest, go alone, do it by yourself. But if you want to get farther away, if you want to go longer distance, you have to go with a team. You have to go together with more people. So that's very interesting. And yeah, I've been impressed in all the projects you, you've been to while working on the show, how you had so many things. I didn't know you were working on this collaboration with Bright Moments. You also were on Proof, Grails. You had a piece there recently. It's a similar question, but how do you find your creative space, Casey, with all these things in mind? Because you can collaborate with people, but you have that in your mind. How do you clear your mind to work on your art? Do you have a studio? I imagine you have a special place or not really, it just comes magically. How is that process for you? I do have a, a space where I can concentrate, <laughs> um, but I've only had one for about the last four years. Most of, my, most of my time has been thinking of the laptop as my studio, thinking as a good pair of headphones and music as the other part of the studio. But the way that I try and spend my week is to work on, have all my feral file meetings on one day, do my teaching on two separate days, and really try and have complete days cleared out. I'm the kind of person who, it really takes me a few hours to get my head into the right zone for making work. And then in addition, we've touched on collaboration a little bit. When I'm making work in the studio, I really am alone. And so I like those two different modes. I like having the space where I'm just alone with my thoughts, as well as working on these much larger collaborative projects too. Right. That's like organizing your days in blocks and putting a special time for each initiative. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just a reminder for anyone in the audience, if you have questions for Casey, we have around 10 minutes. So if you have questions, you can use the bottom chat icon to send your tweets. And if you missed the early part of the space, I shared this on my podcast in my newsletter so you can listen to it anytime you want in the future and actually we got a question Casey which is interesting topic is the future Manuel Larino is asking about you've been around for over 20 years you have seen the evolution you have been teaching you have been doing all these initiatives in the space what do you think will happen in the next 20 years do you have any thesis do you have any theory what are your thoughts what is Casey thinking 10, 20 years from now, in terms of digital art. <laughs> That is so <laughs> rough. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe one thing I can talk about is there's been generations of digital artists, generative artists. I've been really fortunate to meet a lot of the people who are in the generation above me. People like Roman Verotsko, Jean-Pierre Hibert, Harold Cohen, Frieder Nake, Manfred Moore. I think for people of that generation who started working in the 1960s and 1970s, They worked in relative obscurity for years. Finding community, finding global interest, finding institutional support was a real challenge for them. I think I'm of a generation, I just turned 50, 
where we have had opportunities. They have been not as available as opportunities of artists who work in different media, but opportunities have been there. I think in the future, or I want to believe in the future, that this sort of cold reception of code-based work in art spaces will continue to thaw, that younger generations of artists will have more ability to have support, to have a collector base for their work. And I really hope the things that have changed over the last few years will, even though things have at large changed again, that there is new support for this kind of work, new interest and support for this kind of work. I think shows like the program show at the Whitney Museum of American Art a number of years back, things like the Coded show at LACMA, I feel like it's the moment for the history of this work and the future of this work to be in a larger dialogue and for there to be more opportunities for artists working in this media. It, I've seen it change a lot over the last 20 years. And I think that's something that even with the, the boom and the bust of what's gone on over the last couple of years, I, th I believe that support will continue to accelerate. Right. That was my question in terms of, have you noticed already things changing? You mentioned that they are. And in terms of the art, Casey, when we think about generative art, digital art, where do you think the movement is going? This is, of course, a very open question. But when you think about styles, when you think about technologies, what the artists are doing these days, when you think about the platforms like Federal File, what curators are doing, do you see some trends in terms of the new art that has been created? Do you see some movements or you think it's still too early to classify them and to conceptualize them and define them? What are your thoughts there? I'm really interested in work that operates with the blockchain in a social way. So blockchain, rather than being only a technology, it's a space for interactions. So, for example, pieces like Sarah Friend's Life Forms, where the work has to keep moving from wallet to wallet to stay alive, or Lauren Lee McCarthy's uh, Good Morning, where it needs to be visited every day to sort of keep the artwork running. I think these are really interesting hybrids between blockchain as a technology and a, as a social medium. I'm excited to see more work along those lines. Just one thing that I've seen change over the last 20 years too is the capability of artist visions to be realized outside of the constraints of technology like for example when i first started making work i wasn't able to imagine what i was running in real time because computers just couldn't handle it i ended up doing a lot of print-based media because it would take like a minute or so for the work to render i see those kinds of pieces falling away and i think work that is inherently systemic or work that is kinetic that it is more possible now. I think the one piece that just isn't there yet is how to live with this work, how to display this work on devices that are beyond our phones. I think that is maybe the last piece. I really hope that what we're calling generative art can become more of a wider art form in the same way that cinema, film, music, is something that is a part of popular culture as well as a part of sort of more uh, micro communities too. I hope digital art will be able to spread and to grow in, in the same way of those other wider media. Yeah, that's a very interesting thought. Actually, I've been moving to a new place over the past month and I've been thinking a lot about that, how to display, I have generative art, I have digital art, and that's for me as well, it's like the missing piece. You can really see it when you go to these events. Seth Goldstein, uh, actually from Bright Moments, he was mentioning that when you see display, the better the display, the better the screen is when things click. But when you look at it on your phone, it's not the best possible way to look at it. I agree with you. I think that there is a missing piece there. And yeah, we'll see how it evolves. I think that there are different companies that are different people working on this and we'll see what they bring together. Casey, thank you so much for your time. This was a very insightful conversation. I just want to close with what's next for you. I know you're tired. You've been working so much recently, but any ideas maybe after you take your rest in the next month, what is your mind at in terms of art in the next year or two years? Yeah, I think the next couple of months for me are really exciting because I'm wrapping up a few series of works that have been many years uh, in the making. 
So I have an opening in Berlin at Dam Projects in the middle of September, which will wrap up many years of work I've been doing with machine learning and synthetic photography. And then I have the show at Bitforms in New York in November, which is going to be wrapping up the still life and empty room body of work. And then I have a show opening in London in the spring. That will be a show of completely new work, things that I've been making over the spring and things that I'm going to be making during the fall. And for me, for a lot of years, I've been working with machine learning algorithms and working with generative art. This next show, I'm getting my head into making a synthesis of the two. I'm very excited to share that work with people in the spring. Oh, that sounds amazing. I cannot wait. Did you mention where it will be displayed in London, these new works, or you haven't announced that yet? I don't think it's been announced yet, but I think maybe that's a future announcement. Yeah. The dates aren't pinned down either. All right. So that sounds very exciting. The combination of coded art, machine learning, that's, I think, more and more I see that trend, the combination, the mixing of both disciplines, technologies. But that's fantastic case. I'll be looking forward to that and also to the opening of our show. Finally, after so many months working on this, super excited about that. It will be, for people listening, we'll start showing the, the previews of the artworks through the Blind Gallery. It will be also shared on Feral File. And the show will run on FX Hash. And the dates and all the details will be shared soon. Thanks so much, Casey, for your time. Hope you had a well-deserved yeah, rest after all your work. Yeah, thanks, Cal. It's always good to talk. Thanks for the wonderful hosting. And talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.